Real quick, do you say mayo or mayo? Mayo. Sorry, here we go. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right. It's time for Tycoons of Small Biz, spotlighting the true backbone of the American economy, the true tycoons of business in America, the owners, founders, and CEOs of small businesses. The show's hosts, Austin Peterson and Landon Mance, are registered representatives of Lincoln Financial Advisors Corporation, a broker-dealer, member SIPC, and registered investment advisor. The views expressed by your hosts, Austin and Landon, are not necessarily the views of Lincoln Financial Advisors. Let's lean in as Austin and Landon connect with this week's Tycoons. Good afternoon, Tycoons, and welcome to today's episode of Tycoons of Small Biz. I am co-host number one this week. Landon was co-host number one last week, so uh, I will take number one this week. Landon Mance, of course, is here from Las Vegas, and we are excited to have Vicki Mayo in studio with us today or on the show with us today. Uh, uh, Vicki is CEO and co-founder of the Touchpoint Solution and so much more, so she will hopefully uh, talk to us a little bit about those things as well. But Vicki, thanks for being here. We appreciate you coming in and being on the show. Thanks so much, Austin and Landon. Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah. We're excited to hear your story. We've uh, talked a little bit before coming on on air here about your story and, and what it is that you're trying to get out there. But before we jump into that, we, we do want to start with your personal story, if you're okay with that, whether it's you know, your journey to get to where you are today. Tell us about your family. Tell us about your upbringing, any of that kind of stuff that you'd like to share with the audience. We, we always like to start with the personal side, if that's all right. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, my, my story is uh, probably, probably the first time you're ever going to hear a story like this. Let me, let me tease you with that. Um, I, uh, I've always had a penchant for entrepreneurship. I started off being an entrepreneur and I, you know, we talked about it pre-show a little bit. Uh, I'm a daughter of immigrants. I'm first generation and definitely had that entrepreneurship blood, um, you know, put into me at a young age. So I started my first company when I was 14 and it was actually um, the forerunner to what Expedia does, which is a one-stop shop for booking everything. So I would put ads in the classifieds and I'm dating myself. This is like late nineties um, saying, you know, call me and I will book your entire vacation experience from beginning to end. Uh, and after school that was in but middle school or late early high school, I would call people back and you know book their vacation for them. Um, and then when I was seventeen, I sold that so I could go off to college. So that's you know probably a little bit unique that my entrepreneurial journey started younger than most. But you know I always think back. One of my most favorite poems was always Robert Frost's Two Roads Diverged in the Yellow Wood," and I took the one less traveled by. That happened to me when I was twenty. So I went off to college, sold this business, went off to college, had a great college career. And then when I was 20 years old, I graduated from, from college. And the day I graduated, I found two children that had been abandoned by their parents alone in an apartment. Um, and they were 12 and 13. And I made the decision in that very moment to be their mom. And so overnight, 20 years old, can't even legally drink. And I am now the mom to two teenagers. Wow. That's, I don't, I don't know if any of us could top that story. I think that's something else. So you got to finish the story for us now. Tell us where, where they are today and what they're accomplishing. Cause they've got to be adults by now get based on the ages you gave us. Yeah, they are. They're 29 and 30 years old. Um, they are just the most amazing kids. And I will tell you, this really was that, that two roads. Um, it was definitely a less traveled path, but I learned so much from them. I became who I am today from that experience of raising, you know, these kids, um, but they're, they're amazing. So my oldest is 30 now. Um, he's actually working in one of our companies as a senior operations manager. He's worked his way up and he had that entrepreneurial bug as well. So when he was 20, he bought his first home. Um, he, uh, actually made his own daycare center with a really different uh, business model um, and then ended up selling that a few years later and then uh, you know tried a couple different things and then decided he wanted to come back and learn you know one of the businesses that we had so that's great and my 29 year old graduated from ASU full ride scholarship 
um, you know, just amazing in IT work and now pursues a career in IT. So great boys. Yeah, that's, that is very impressive. And uh, I take my hat off to you for, for doing that. You know, we, we try to do what we can to serve underserved communities whenever we get a chance. But uh, I think what you did is, is above and beyond. And I applaud you for that. That's it, it. So it actually reminds me of something that I listened to this morning when I was on my run. I was listening to Simon Sinek's Start With Why uh, mm-hmm. on Audible this morning, right, while I was running. And one of the things, one of the points that he made was there's a difference between achievements and success, right? Mm -hmm. And what you just described is success. You did something that really should make you feel successful, right? It may not be the best thing that you did financially or building a company or whatever, but you, I already know, are a successful person for having done that regardless of what your business achievements are. So I applaud you for that. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. You know, I, I tell everyone that I tell the story to, I said, you know, um, it was it was a big thing that I did, but that doesn't mean that that's the only way to make a difference. You, we pass by people every day and we don't know that backstory. And I just tell everyone, you know, treat somebody the way you'd want to be treated. You know, it's simplistic, that golden rule, but, you know, it makes a difference for these kids. And they tell me, you know, when they were alone, they were alone in this apartment that the neighbor would come over and give them food. Or even just there were days when they were so down, a kind smile like went so far. And so I, I, I tell everybody, you don't know the number of people that you're impacting every day with even the small things you're doing, whether it's just, you know, a smile and acknowledgement, because you might be the only person that person saw that day. So you know, you have a moment of truth every time you're seeing everyone. And so take advantage of that moment of truth and just to live that moment to its fullest. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I tell you, I mean, I'm still just in awe <laughs> sitting back thinking how in the world <laughs> does somebody do that in, in your situation at that point? So I, I just can't get over how impressive that is. And that's, you know, I, I am, honored to know you having having known that portion of your story so i, I appreciate well, you sharing you. it with us yeah it was a, definitely a hard decision to make um because because when i did it and again i told you i'm first first generation uh, my parents were t- from india um you know and this was very atypical you know it's because in our culture you know, it's getting better and it's changing, but in our culture, you know, women are not meant to have these careers. They're supposed to get married and have children. And that's sort of like the, the epitome and the, the, you know, the highest calling is you need to get married and have children. Well, when I adopted the kids, my parents were so angry. They actually disowned me. And they said, you know, like, who's going to marry you now? You can't, why would you do this? You're ruining your life. You know, and in my mind, I'm thinking, it's not like I'm a drug addict, right? I adopted some <laughs> children. So, but I guess, I guess if you want to disown me for adopting children, you know, I get it. Um, you know, of course they've come around, it took them, it took them some time, you know, but they've come around to that decision I made, but it was a really, really rough time in my life. So I didn't, you know, you're 20, you just graduated, you know, what kind of jobs are even available to you at that point? And there's this huge financial burden of attorneys and the child welfare system. I got very entangled in child welfare because in the state of Arizona, you can't, you know, just adopt a child. These kids were technically wards of the court. So I had to actually go through CPS. Now it's DCS in Arizona, you know, go through the system. And so that actually was a huge turning point in my life. And that's actually what drove me to be where I am today. So this story really is that, that road that I traveled on. It's taken me, you know, all sorts of ways. If you would ask me as a kid, like, what, you know, what are you going to do when you grow up? I don't think I could have, I could have pointed to this moment right now. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think, I think we're all uh, in that state in some way, shape or form. Right. I mean, I've talked a little bit about this on the show before. I I grew up relatively poor. Mm -hmm. Um, My dad was an entrepreneur, which kind of led me down this path of of being in business for myself. But he was really just an entrepreneur in terms of providing himself a job. And then he had a couple of other employees along the way, but it wasn't building this big empire per se. Right. Um, But he also never made a tremendous amount of money. There were years where we were on welfare and food stamps and, you know, all those sorts of things. And, and that's kind of what drives me 
to, to have a better life for my kids, right? Now, my kids are not as old as the ones that, that you took in, but they're 20, almost 21 and almost 18. And they're in that pivotal time in their life where, gosh, you know, I, I call it the decade of decision. And that's not my own phrase. I picked that up from some other people. But, you know, yeah. really between 15 and 25 is that decade of decision where you're really making so many super important decisions that can lead you one way or another, right, mm -hmm. um, to having a great life or, or a not so great life, or, you know, just being on a path that maybe you thought you wanted to be on, but you didn't really want to be on. So it's, uh, it's, it's interesting to watch and, and to see them learn and grow and, and make decisions on their own. And, you know, it, it's crazy to think so we did start relatively young, not as young as you, but my wife and I are going to be empty nesters in six months. You know, oh, I mean, it, it's, <laughs> it's crazy to think about, you know, cause they'll both be off at college and, mm -hmm. you know, life is, life is about to change in a big way. So. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's a phase for sure. You're about yeah. to get into the, the decade of free time. Are you ready for that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I paid a severe price raising uh -huh. children. <laughs> and so now I've got to get that payoff. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, to that and obviously looking forward to see what they end up doing with with their careers and their family lives as well. So, yeah, it's so interesting. They become yeah. little people. We have two biological children as well, um, my husband and I, and they are uh, 10 and 12. And and I marvel. I just think to myself, you know, three years ago, I was actually taller than you. Um, now I'm not. And, <laughs> and you, you also, you know, would listen to what I have to say. And now you're like a little person with a real personality and you want to tell me your opinion on things, whether I want it or not. So yeah. that evolution of children, it's, it's so fascinating. So rewarding. Yeah, no, there's, there's no doubt about it. I could, I could talk about parenting children all day, every day, but that's not the main reason we're here. So let's talk a little bit about that, well, let's start with the touch point solution. You can tell us kind of what that is, what, what that means to you. And, and then we can go from there to other businesses that you have or wherever you'd like to go. So let's start there. Great. So, uh, you know, I shared a little bit about this child welfare background and I um, learned, you know, how much trauma is created when you have to, you, when you lose those bonds that you have and you don't have your family. Um, and so trauma is something that you know, sort of sparked this interest in me. Um, I had a friend who was a neuropsychologist and my, my daughter at the time, who was four years old, she was struggling with night terrors. And I, you know, just in a mom conversation one morning, I was like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm so exhausted for my daughter not sleeping. And she said, well, you know, night terrors are the result of unpressed, unprocessed, and it's not trauma, but for like a four-year-old, anything they go through, they need to take that information and file it away in their brain, and they're not able to, so it manifests as these night terrors. She said, you know, I've been doing this research on this technology um, that uses bilateral stimulation. So bilateral stimulation means that you have a vibration on the right and then the left side of your body, and it keeps repeating. And she said, this has been used by the Wealth World Health Organization. It's, you know, the most widely accepted treatment for PTSD. I have an idea about it, but I don't really know what to do with it. You know, and at this point, I think I have had five or six businesses. Um, and I said, well, it's a good thing you told me about it because I'm an entrepreneur and I think we need to try it out. So we tried it first on my daughter and in the middle of a particularly heinous night ter terror, I put what would later become touch points into her hands. So she held on to them in, in her sleep, right? I didn't wake her up because you can't wake them up. And um, within like just a few seconds, she just stopped screaming and crying. And then she went to sleep and she slept all night. And when she woke up the next morning, she, you know, she was so happy. And so I, you know, dropped her off to school and I called my friend and I go, oh my God, what is that thing? And what are we going to do about it? You know? And and she's like, well, I don't know, I'm a scientist. And I said, well, I'm an entrepreneur. So let's make this a reality. And in my mind, I was thinking, you know, the number of children that have such severe trauma from getting pulled away from their parents or, you know, domestic violence, and then the children get removed. And I said, if we could just put touch points in the hands of not just the children that are suffering this trauma, but the parents, because the parents are having trauma and it's uh, manifesting itself generation over generation. Like, how do we break the cycle? 
And, and it doesn't even have to be that widespread trauma. Going and talking to your boss when you're scared of talking to your boss or doing a public speaking, any of these you know, typical things we do in a day, they create a little bit of trauma. And, and if we don't treat it, it creates stress. Stress turns into anxiety. Anxiety starts wrecking havoc on our body. Before you know it, you can't sleep at night. And if you go backwards and look at the root cause of all of it, it's like, how do we treat the stress? So it's been about a year in development, um, built a, an app, built a hardware device, and then we launched on the market in December of 2016 with this product called Touch Points. Uh, made by the Touchpoint Solution, and it has been just a whirlwind ever since. Um, they were rated Best Health and Wellness Technology by Forbes and Digital Trends. We were shortlisted as Time's Best Invention of the Year. Um, we won like 40 or 50 different accolades in the last year alone. So it's it's been really exciting, but it's definitely, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a baby company. It started just four or five years ago. Well, it sounds like you've been on a great roller coaster ride thus far. And, you know, as, as you describe these different things and well, it's a good thing you connected with me because I'm an entrepreneur, you know, you start to you start to see a little bit of your personality mm. and we didn't talk about your significant other or your spouse. And and so it makes me think as somebody who's been married 22 years, who in the world is is <laughs> Vicky with that can handle being with Vicky like that doesn't feel intimidated by Vicky. Yeah, it's uh, my husband's a, an incredible businessman. And actually, I think he's my business b- biggest mentor. Um, you know, we talk about women in the workplace and allyship, and he has been nothing but a support to me and other women, you know, as we brought them up through the ranks. But uh, yeah, my husband uh, is toe to toe with me, head to head. You know, we, we um, were business partners in, in almost all the businesses, actually all the businesses. And, uh, and partners for life, which I think adds an entirely another level of complexity to our relationship, because not only, um, you know, do we do all the business stuff together and then you come home and you're still together and you have your kids and your life. And so um, navigating marriage with this different sort of paradigm has, has been interesting, but we've created a set of tools and, and it's been very fun. So. Well, my, my wife would be the first to tell you that that would never work in our marriage. <laughs> we actually worked for the same company for about six months right after we got married. Mm-hmm. And that was enough for her. She, she knew that she could not work with me uh, and then also have our personal life and, and have the two intertwined would not have gone well for us. So yeah. hat, hats off to you for that. Yeah. Well, I credit that really big success actually to the same reason why our businesses are successful and believe it or not, it's a simple thing. It's a scorecard. Hmm. So every, if you think about it, you you ask your employees to perform and you say, okay, I need you to do X number of widgets a day or make X number of phone calls or process so many applications, whatever it is, sell so much stuff that there's a metric associated with that. And if you're not, we believe in metric driven organizations. So as we're building our companies, you know, we ask every employee, what does success look like? What are the metrics we need to measure? Because you can't manage what you're not measuring. And there's a way to quantify everything, believe me. So <laughs> we, we create these scorecards for all of our employees. And about, I think it's like nine years ago. So we've been married 14 years. So about nine years ago, um, we looked at each other and we said, well, if we have a scorecard for everybody at work, why don't we have a scorecard for each other, for personal goals, for our children, for our marriage? And so we have scorecards for each other. And we, um, you know, and they're stock lighted, red, yellow, green metrics on it. And it's things like how much time did you spend with the kids? How many home cooked meals did we do this week? How many times did you do the dishes, right? Everything that's important to us, we put on a scorecard so that you can manage it. And then there's no surprises. And, you know, during our monthly, or we have one date night to review the scorecard. And during that date night, you know, it's really a Um, a good venue. So having these conversations with your significant other or at work, even with your business partner, you know, it, it gets, no one likes conflict, right? I mean, Landon, Austin, you guys don't like conflict, right? It's it's never fun. So if you, if you come to the conversation with, you know, a scorecard and you're like, Hey dude, you know, you were supposed to sell X dollars, but you're red in your metric. You suddenly the conflict is gone because it's on paper. And so even in your marriage, if there's these uncomfortable conversations, you know, bring it up, put in your scorecard, and it's a venue to talk about something that otherwise may have been contentious. 
Yeah. Well, that's some food for thought for me. I'm not sure about he, even how she would respond to bringing up the scorecard, to be honest with you. What do you, what do you think, Lan? And how would Tia respond to you bringing a scorecard home? Yeah. Um, I, I'm not sure. I, I, I've got mixed, uh, mixed thoughts and, uh, feelings about that, but, uh, I would be very curious Vicky to see what that, what the, uh, personal scorecard looks like and what all you guys have on it. Uh, just because I'm, I'm so, I'm so curious, but I wanted to ask you just something before we, we moved on, uh, from this, um, touch point, you said, um, it is a, uh, it's a technology where, uh, th there's some frequency that's generated on the left side and the right side of your, of your body. And I'm not quite sure exactly how that's applied. If it's a, uh, something you have to touch, but could maybe, could you talk to us a little bit more about that? And then just talk to the science, um, behind it a little bit, just so that we can kind of understand it a little bit better? Certainly. So it's actually a wearable device. So think about like an Apple watch. So it's, you know, the Apple watch has a square face. So it's the same size as an Apple watch, but it's just sort of a square face and it has wristbands with it. So you would put them on your wrists, on the right wrist and the left wrist. So you generally tend to spot use touch points. Um, so for example, like you and Landon have a scorecard conversation with each other and you're nervous about it. So you put your touch points on and you would use it and you would use it generally about 15 to 20 minutes before the stressful event. And you can even wear it during that stressful event. So one of the, the other things to keep in mind is you don't have to wear it on your wrists. So it's not conspicuous. You can actually slide your wristbands off and they're, they're small coin shaped. You can put them in your pockets. You can put them in your socks. A lot of women will just stuck it into their tank top straps here. And so you can wear it in a hidden fashion. So no one has to know that you're using them but you only need them for about 20 minutes. And I personally like to put them on in the morning while I drink my coffee because it just tones down your stress response. So you wanted to know the science behind it. Okay, so right now, you know, Landon and Austin, both of you and anybody that's listening, just close your eyes and don't close your eyes if you're driving, but close your eyes and just think of a stressful event, right? You don't have to tell me what it is. Just think about it and really remember that stressful event. And now I want you to notice your body. Where do you feel that tension in your body? So Austin, where do you feel it? It's always my neck and shoulders. Mm -hmm. Landon, what about you? Um, neck and shoulders, but also um, my hands. Yeah, right? Mm -hmm. So everybody, when, when I tell them and I, I bring up this awareness, okay, whenever you feel stress, your body reacts and gives you a sensation of pain. And the reason this happens is because we're all wired with this fight or flight response. So it was millions of years ago when we were running from saber tooth tigers, this fight or flight response is what would save our lives actually. Now you fast forward millions of years, what has happened over time is that the fight or flight is actually um, in your, it's in the lower part of your brain. I call it your lower brain. And over time, and it's truly like the lowest part of your brain in the back of your head, over time, the front of your brain, your prefrontal cortex, those have all developed and they're much more sophisticated parts of the brain. But because this part of your brain started so many millions of years ago, it always kicks in first. So during the day, your fight or flight mechanism kicks on two, 300 times a day when it doesn't need to. It actually is the first thing to come on um, when, when we're like, Hey, the show's about to start your fight or flight will kick on actually for like maybe four or five seconds. And then it'll turn off, but this ongoing repetitive fight or flight is actually deteriorating your body. So it's creating, um, you know, if you're able to turn it off quickly enough, it actually will create stress. So it creates a physical sensations. It releases chemicals, which are not healthy for your body. And it makes you overreact to everything happening. So if your fight or flight kicked off and then you needed to have a conversation with somebody, more than likely you're going to snap at that person because you're reacting out of this sense of fear. So what the touch points actually do, and this is what's so groundbreaking about the technology, it turns off your fight or flight response in 30 seconds or less. So if, if we were in person, Landon and Austin, I would have told you to think about that thing. And I would have asked you to rate that stress level on a zero to 10 and rate your body sensations. I would have handed you touch points. And 30 seconds later, I would have said, okay, how does your body feel? And you're going to say, the body feeling is completely gone. 
And then I would say, okay, well, I want you to think about that stressful thing and you're going to think about it. And if it was an eight, it's going to be like a three now. And it's because by turning off the fight or flight, we're taking away that emotional association. The fear factor is gone. So now you can be very logical and rational about these things. And you can say, well, now it makes sense. You know, yes, I had a traumatic car accident five years ago, but I haven't had one since. I'm probably not going to get in a car accident when I get in the car right now, right? So that's that's how that technology works. What we're doing is just turning off the fight or flight. All right. So I've got a follow-up question and it, it's specific and personal to me. I mentioned this just before we went on air. My, my daughter uh, has always had some anxiety and some, you know, she has a, a difficult time dealing with stress and always has throughout her, her whole life. COVID has made that worse. And we've all read all kinds of stuff about that and, and you know, not being in school and all these kinds of things that have kind of led to her having greater anxiety and stress in her life today. Plus, she's going off to college, out of state, living on her own for the first time. She's got a job for the first time. She's got, you know, all these responsibilities that are compounding on top of her normal inability to deal with stress and anxiety the way that the majority of the population is able to do so, right? I I think everybody deals with stress and anxiety, but others are able, some are able to cope with it better than others, right? And so I've watched over the last year, this become just almost debilitating for my 17 year old daughter. So if she's dealing with that, and and I'm sure there are people listening right now, your customers, our clients, families, whatever, that, you know, I'm not the only one who has somebody close to me dealing with this. So in her situation at this, and, and one other thing to mention is she's also had four concussions in the last year Oh from being God. on the, <laughs> yeah, from being on the high school dive team, right? Like swim and dive. Yeah. Um, and so that, I guess, is, you know, compounded it even more. And so now she's dealing with insomnia and all these kinds of things. And so given that background, you know, before a stressful situation, I get that, use it for 15, 20 minutes. But if she's having trouble sleeping, is this something that you would wear all night? Is it something that you would wear 20 minutes, 30 minutes before going to bed. And then that relaxes you enough. What, how would you use your, your device in that situation? Yeah. Great questions. Well, I am so sorry for your daughter that concussions are are tough and that's a tough run, but unfortunately what you're sharing is not that abnormal. I mean, because of COVID this has been so exacerbated. So um, what, so for your daughter and for anyone that's listening that has this, we, um, we would suggest like a little bit more of a heavy regimen initially. So I would tell her when she wakes up in the morning, you know, was she, she's a coffee drinker or meditates or whatever she does in the morning, or even getting dressed and doing your makeup, put those touch points on, just tuck them in your, your tank top straps, um, put them on, wear them for 20 or 30 minutes. There's, there's no, you can't overuse touch points. At some point, you'll feel like I don't need them, like take them off. And and everyone hits that point. But for some people, they might hit that point for 45 minutes or even four hours. So I have her put them on in the morning because what it'll do is it'll allow her to start her day in a more calm, relaxed fashion, which will then help it to move along through the day smoother. So anytime she feels stressed out, right? Let's say she just went into the grocery store and came out, but all those people overwhelmed her, put your touch points on. But at night, when the insomnia starts, right? If she normally goes to bed, let's say 10 p.m., we actually have um, something called touch points for sleep. So the main difference is it has a timer in it and the other version does not. So you would put the touch points for sleep on at 9.30. I do it 30 minutes before she goes to bed and they have a zippered sweatband. So you take the, the, the devices off, drop them in the zippered sweatband and placement is also a big thing. So with sleep, you want to place them. A lot of people put it on their forearms, pull, like pull the sweatbands up. Sometimes people like to put them on their ankles. So it's probably going to be a couple of days of testing, but put them on and within 30 minutes, she'll actually be asleep. And then the touch points will turn off in 30 minutes. She might wake up in the middle of the night again. And if she does, she her touch points will be on her, turn them back on and do another 30 minute segment. And, and actually the you know, everyone says, is there a side effect of touch points? And I said, yes, um, it'll actually break the, the insomnia or break the stress. 
So my husband, uh, he travels a lot. And before COVID, he was traveling all the time and he'd go to different time zones and have a terrible time sleeping. And his time zones were so out of whack from traveling. He literally wouldn't sleep. So he started using touch points um, and he would use them every single day for about 60 days. And then there was a trip where he forgot him, but he was like, he, he actually didn't even need them. And then after that, he weaned himself off. So we only every once in a while spot uses them for sleep now because of using the touch points in a consistent manner for two months, he actually completely desensitized himself from this insomnia and he's able to sleep again, but it requires, you know, repetitive use for some time. And usually 21 days is what you need to break a habit. And then it's really solidified within 40. So. Hmm. Cool. Well, is this, is it something you want to share pricing yeah. on the show or would you rather lead them to the website? What, how would you like to address that portion? Absolutely. Well, please check it out. So you can go to ilovetouchpoint.com or Google the touchpoint solution. And it's actually, we tried to make it as affordable as possible. It's $180 and that includes damage insurance in case you, you know, drop one and roll your car over it or get them wet, you know, anything like that. So we want to make sure that you have access to that technology. And if you sign up on our website for our email newsletter, I believe there's a 10% off coupon um, to take 10% off. So it's there. And uh, Landon, you'd asked about that personal scorecard. If you go to our website and click on blog, we actually have blog articles where we've shared the personal scorecard and the entire template and format of that methodology. Okay, awesome. Well, that, cool. that is a perfect segue into my, uh, my next uh, question that I have for you. But uh, I will mention, Vicki, I think... Um, uh, if Austin and I would have would have known one tenth of all of this about you, I think we would have scheduled you for about three or four different uh, interviews over the course of you know the next year. So uh, just a lot of really uh, great conversations so far, and uh, so we're we're just really really thankful and grateful to uh, to have you on, and we will definitely be having you back. But I want to circle back to something that you um, mentioned earlier, which was. Uh, the scorecard use in your businesses. Yep. Now, Austin and I, uh, you know, we are focused uh, exclusively on working with new business owners when it comes to our new relationships. Um, and uh, I think Austin and I would agree uh, that for somebody that owns three or four or five or how many, however many businesses that you have, there is not enough hours in the day for you to be working full time in all of those businesses. And Austin and I use the term a lot that uh, that I borrowed from a guy named uh, Josh Patrick. He talks about operational irrelevance and how important that is in your business, especially when it comes to succession and, and exit planning, because it just drives the value of, of your business substantially. Mm -hmm. So my question for you is, um, I believe uh, that you use a, uh, for lack of a better term, a uh, program or a process or whatever you want to call it called Six Sigma. Six Sigma. Mm -hmm. And I'm assuming that you probably use that in all of your businesses. And I'm also assuming that the scorecards have something to do with that. So can you tell us what is Six, Sig Six Sigma? How do you incorporate it into your business? And is the scorecard part of that process? Yes. So Six Sigma is actually a traditional term that came from the manufacturing industry. When you think about factories, right? And making cars, which are widgets. So it's like, how, how can I make a car which has, you know, 10,000 pieces and make it as fast as possible with the least amount of errors. So Six Sigma is really trying to get to statistically almost virtually zero errors. And this is what made Toyota so famous and most of the car companies and manufacturing lines have adopted Six Sigma. Um, there's a, a softer side to that concept. So the concept is, how do I do something with no errors? And that could be, you know, identified in all the, the not just manufacturing. So for example, you have a customer service company. How do I ensure that a customer buys my product, gets it delivered, gets the customer service they need with no errors? So it's the same sort of flow. Um, and so the softer side is called lean, you know, and sometimes people refer to it as lean Six Sigma. And so I'm a huge believer 
Um, it makes me so happy whenever I get to talk about like being efficient, because I really think that this is what makes or breaks leaders is how are you able to scale and how can you be efficient? So the, the system that we've developed, um, it's at each company, we call it the Valor way, the GMI way, the Touchpoint way, but it's basically the system of, first of all, understanding from the highest level a value stream map. So what do I do? What does my business do? And what's my core function? And we actually like process map that on the wall using sticky notes where it says, okay, so where does my process start? The customer goes to my website and then the customer goes to my website and then the customer clicks add to cart and then they check out. And then when they check out, it gets shipped. And so you literally like flow all that through. And then you look at each area of that. So if I am the website team, I should be looking at, first of all, how many people even come to my website? That's my metric. How many people come to my website? How many people bounce immediately? How many people stay on my website for so many pages? How many people actually add to cart, right? And at the end of the day, if you're a website guy, you are make it or break it by how many people add that guy to cart and then check out, right? That's the conversion rate optimization. And you've got all these guys that call themselves and gals growth hackers, and that's all they work on. How do I incentivize someone to click? So a website person would do, um, once you do your value stream map, you would break your, your process into teams, right? So you've got a website team, you might have a shipping team, you might have a manufacturing team, you might have a customer service team. And you would say to them, okay, what's the key function? What are the things you do that create success? And then you would make a metric associated with each one of those things that create success. So then each person has a scorecard. So you're like, oh, that's great and fine, Vicky, but you know everyone's gonna forget to update their scorecard. Well, not so, because we created, you said operational, in, uh, what did you say, irrelevance? Irrelevance, right? yep. This organization should run, whether or not I'm there or not. It should be, it should run like clockwork. So how do we do that? We create an operating rhythm using a system of tiered huddle communication. So um, let's pretend like we have, you know, 10 employees in that website team and there's one manager and like nine people reporting. That manager at the website team every day, every day needs to have a daily huddle where they meet with their team and they, they ask two things. One is like, what is red on your scorecard? So your scorecard should be red, yellow, or green. What's red on your scorecard? What are you gonna do about it? And the second question is, what are the roadblocks? Why can't you do your job today? And then the manager's job then is to take that information from his team and he should have a meeting in the morning, let's say 8 a.m. At 9 a.m., every head of every 10 teams you have gets together in a, in a tiered huddle. And then that manager says, hey, my website guy, you know, the cloud's down and he can't do his job. And I, I tried, I can't fix it. I'm up leveling this. So information should flow up. And what you're up leveling is all of your roadblocks. And you should solve them at your level. And if you can't, level it up. And it, it keeps leveling up until it gets to the highest level of the organization. Now, conversely, information should flow down. And usually there's not a problem with flow downs. People love to do staff meetings and tell everybody all sorts of nonsensical stuff. But in this huddle structure, we say that information should mostly flow up because that's where the work happens. So it's this entire system that allows me to not have to be in the day-to-day -day of work. I can step out and, and the business will continue running because everyone's doing their huddles every day. There's a weekly cadence, there's a monthly cadence, there's a quarterly cadence and an annual cadence. And so the operating rhythm combined with the structures of scorecards allows a business to do nothing but excel. Because if you're working on what's causing the reds, what, if you're doing countermeasures, to fix a metric that's in the red, your business has no option but to get better. So, and if it doesn't, then you probably are measuring the wrong thing. That's that's the only reason why your business won't get better. Yeah. So, sorry, Austin, let, let me just ask a, a, a quick follow-up and then you can uh, jump in. Because I know I'm thinking this and I I, I know that some of our, our listeners and, and clients are going to be thinking this as well. So, I do believe, Vicki, that what you just described, every business owner understands the importance and has a desire to do what you just described. Uh, do most business owners do that? Um, I would say probably not, but they do understand the importance of that. They just don't know how to execute on something like that. So my question is, 
Um, did you learn how to do this through the adoption of Six Sigma? Or is this, this just something that, uh, you know, you, you've pulled out of your head and, and been able to capture, you know, and, and um, you know, formalize it through this, this process? Because I, I would imagine some people are thinking, yeah, that, that, sounds, that sounds great, but I don't have different heads of, you know, divisions and, and stuff like that. So what do you say to the smaller businesses that maybe only have five or 10 or 20 employees that don't really have a sophisticated, you know, management team, how do they start doing something like this? Yeah, great questions. And you're right. So first thing is, uh, where did the system come from? So it's a little bit of a hodgepodge of systems and then just something we grew. So Simmer and I grew and developed this, this method and we've, we've got, you know, we built this method, but if you, if you want something off the shelf, read Scaling Up by Vern Harnish. It's a bit dry, uh, you know, but it's worth reading, but he has great diagrams and things in it. Um, so you're a small business owner. Touchpoint's a small business. We have less than 15 people. So in that, I don't have a website division. In fact, I only have contractors that do web work, right? They're not even here. So how do you, how do I use the system there? So I, I make, I give my contractors a scorecard. Uh, there's no reason why they don't have to do a daily huddle with me, but you know, contractors love like your website people, you know, they, or, or not your website, your ads, you know, a lot of e-commerce companies use social media ads, go out there and ask for social media ad company. I want not just reporting where you tell me, I want to actually see what's my return on ad spend, what's my cost per acquisition. And I, I want it to hit these targets. And I'm going to fire you in three months if you don't hit these targets, because you and I are going to agree on them now. And if you don't go do a good job, I have the right to fire you. And you need to set that expectation out when you're using contractors and small businesses, you guys out there, I know that's how we get it done because we can't afford to have somebody full-time. So you have the right though, just because they hand you like a standard contract, you don't have to sign it. The devil's in the details. You go and you tell them, look, you seem great and I really want to work with you, but I need your skin to be in the game. So we're going to agree on this scorecard. And if they won't agree on it, then you're not the right vendor for me. At the end of the day, that's what it is. So, so that's how I handle contractors. But even with my team of 15, we meet once a week. So they might not have that tier, the first tier where there's a manager with 10 website guys. So that tier might be out, but we meet once a week on Wednesdays at 1130 Nothing impedes that meeting, you know, having her, you know, can break loose, heaven and hell can break loose, but we have a standing meeting and we have to adhere to that standing meeting. That's the one time every week, the whole team gets together and all their data is required to be in by Wednesday morning. And all I do is I pop in ahead of time. I just look for my reds and then we talk about that and we have a, a preset huddle agenda, which is what I told you two things where you read. What are you going to do about it? And why can't you do your job this week? And so even in the absence of having a scorecard, which I understand can be a daunting task to make, but all you need is an Excel document, right? You just color code it, but you need to at least have huddles. If you don't have regular accountability with a huddle system in place where information is flowing on a regular basis, you're not going to be able to move your organization forward. And it's never going to be scalable because you can sit in the same room with 10 people and talk all the time, but that's different than when you're intentionally saying from a 30,000 foot level, this is what happened this week. These are my problems. This is why I can't do my job. It's different than, you know, sitting at the guy in the next office and chit-chatting. Yep. Well, and I think the key to what you just said is it's not scalable, right? And we've, se we've seen it hundreds of times over our career, Landon and I have, where we've got these business owners who have a great business but they didn't take the time to put that, those processes in place so that their business could become scalable, right? So much is inside of the entrepreneur or the owner's head, founder's head, and it's not being given to the employees and empowering them to do what they need to do, right? Because we talked about it earlier, you want to be operationally irrelevant at some point. You don't start out that way, but at some point you need to be operationally irrelevant to the organization and have the organization continue to thrive, right? Yeah. We call it succession planning for a reason because you're trying to actually transfer to the next person to then take it to the next level, right? It's not just about selling something and giving it to somebody else. You, 
you built your you built this entire business with your blood, sweat, and tears. You want the next person who's buying it from you, or even just taking it over from you and running it as the CEO, and you're still the founder and you know major shareholder or whatever. You want them to be successful. And the only way to do that is these operational processes being put in place, right? Because if you, if you can't get beyond that, then you'll never, you'll hit that plateau and you'll never cross beyond it, right? Yeah. And quite honestly, that's the reason that franchise businesses have a higher success rate than most other businesses because the franchise system gives you the operational manual and says, follow these processes and you'll be successful. Mm -hmm. But when it's not a franchise organization, it's up to the founder and the management team to put together those processes, which you've clearly done. Yeah. And I, and I should have mentioned that with Six Sigma. It's all about with Lean too. It's all about how do you do this the same way every time? Because what you're actually doing is taking out any of the variation in every process. So as a small business owner, do this now before you grow too big. Because if you grow too big, and you'll see there's a lot of companies where they're like, hey, when we were only at... 2 million, everything was fine. And then they got one big PO for Ulta or something or some, you know, Best Buy. And all of a sudden the wheels came off the bus. So while you have the time now, and I know it feels like you don't have time, start doing something we call standard work. So if you, every morning you go into your ticketing system and you assign the tickets out to people, write down on a Word document, here's what I do first and take a screenshot. Here's what I do second. Create, you know, I call it the dummies guide too. And do it now because that way, all of a sudden, when you get that big order, you're like, I'm going to hire a customer service manager. You're going to be like, by the way, here's these 22 Word documents. Like, I know it's not pretty, but you can do your job because you have these 22 Word documents. So we create, we have massive standard work. And that's, that's really, truly, I believe standard work scorecards and huddles and or tiered system of communication. Those are the three things that must be in place in order to scale a business. Yeah. Austin, I know we're thinking the same thing. So yeah. go ahead. And no, say no, it. go ahead. I, I think, I think, I think I know what you're about to say. I did think of it, but you say it because I've got another comment to make. Okay. Yeah. We, we, we had a guest on our show. Uh, I don't know. Three, six months four, ago, maybe. Yeah, three, four, five, six months ago. Uh, guy out of uh, out of Arizona, uh, Chris Ronzio with uh, Trainual, and uh, that is his that is his company. That's what they do. They mm -hmm. help you to capture all of that stuff, and just instead of doing it in Microsoft Word or Excel, you know, you use that platform to capture your uh, you know uh, standard operating procedures, your operational efficiencies, whatever you want to call them so that you can do what, uh, what you just described. So that's all. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think his software is great. It's, it's obviously not the right fit for every organization. Um, but as you start to grow and you get beyond five, seven employees, it's a great way to then take those pictures that you just talked about, right? The pictures of the word documents and put them into this process or into this software, I should say. And then You've got new employees that are sitting there watching a video on how to actually do what you need them to do so that the company can actually scale. So it, it's a great process. He's been receiving all kinds of accolades. They've been very successful. You've probably heard of them, but um, yeah. The, yeah, the one thing that I wanted to, to mention that, that came to mind is, you know, you talked about the scorecards and what what's read and, but really what's read and what's stopping you from that not being read any longer, right? What's, what's help, you know, what do you need to get to yellow? What do you need to be, get to green, whatever. And, and one of the best leaders that I know in business period that I've known for probably, well, gosh, 12, probably 14 years by now, I think 2008 is when we first met. Um, one of the things that she says all the time is there are always going to be obstacles in your way, Right. It's up to you and or your team to figure out how to either hurdle, hurdle those obstacles or go around them, but don't stop in front of them and just let them continue to be an obstacle for you. And, and I think the scorecards are the way that you're dealing with that as an organization. And obviously Six Sigma is a great process that we studied in business school and my eyes kind of glossed over because that's just not the way that I think. I hire people to do those things for me. Um, but it's, it, I know that I know the importance of it, I guess, is, is what I'm trying to, to get across. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. 
All right. So there's a question that I've been dying to ask. I want to make sure that Landon doesn't have something that he wants to, a direction he wants to go. Go ahead, my friend. Okay. So one of the things that you mentioned to us that's important to you, and I think we saw it with the kids that you took in, you know, from the, what they were abandoned inside of that apartment, as well as with the employees of your organization, and that is the word empowerment, right? Mm -hmm. So I'd love to hear in your own words what it is that drives you to empower others and what you see that do for your organization as well as your family, these kids that have thrived that came from a real tough spot, however you want to address that, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on empowerment. Absolutely. Um, so with empowerment, my definition of it is let me give you fences and then you play in those fences. And sometimes those fences may be you know, tight and narrow, um, you know, you only have like a foot to play in here. But a lot of times, you know, especially after someone has shown that they understand and they have the methodology, then they get wide open pastures, right? And I'm like, just don't break these massively big fences. But I think empowerment is, pre is that there's a pre-step. There's, there's something that's predicated on. And empowerment is predicated, in my opinion, on problem solving. So if you don't know how to problem solve, it doesn't matter if I give you a giant pen to play in, you're, you're not going to because you don't know how. And so I believe we've, we've developed leadership academies across all of our businesses with the sole intent to build and create problem solving muscle. Um, and I'll give you a great example. I had a, an HR girl who um, she's, she's so sweet. And she, you know, she was like, Vicki, I need to quit. And I said, why would you need to quit? I don't understand. I said, you know, you're just doing payroll. Not that that's, you know, that's, that's just one, you know, I was like, that's just the first part of your job. Like you're supposed to do other stuff, but you said you needed to just do payroll. And she said, well, it's taking me hours, hours and hours. Like on payroll day, I get up at like 4am and I don't go to bed till like midnight. And I said, well, why? And she said, well, every single day, you know, it's so frustrating. The last five months, I have these error codes and I have to manually go in and we have, you know, several thousand employees. I have to fix error codes on hundreds and hundreds of employees. And this has been going on for months. And I'm thinking to myself, I, I said, you know, I let you down. And she was like, what are you talking about? I said, okay, we have HR huddles every, every day. Why have you never brought up in an HR huddle that you have lines and lines of errors? Because what you should be doing is bringing up the fact that you have a million lines of error and there's a coding problem and we need to figure out what, what's wrong in the system that it's not talking to each other. Because fixing error code lines is not your job. Like your, your job is to process payroll. But, but she was like, well, when I got here, these lines were happening and I just thought that's what my job was and that's why you need a full-time person. And I was like, no, you're not supposed to be full-time doing payroll. But you, you never even, you know, I failed you because you, when we're asking you, what is the roadblock keeping you from doing your job in her mind, that wasn't a roadblock. She's like, that's just the way of doing the business. And that's, that's my failure. I need to teach her. No, if you're getting all these lines, the first question is why ask why I love the exercise of the five whys. If you're doing something today, ask yourself why, and then ask yourself why and why and why until you finally get to the root cause of it. So she should have said, payroll is taking me 14 hours. And I'm asking her, well, why? Well, because I have these error code lines. Okay, well, why? You know, and she never, she never asked herself why. So I believe that it's our responsibility. If we were going to empower her to fix the problem, even if I would have said, hey, um, I would have said, hey, HR person, I'm giving you, you know, this wide open space. You have access to any resource you need to do your job. She don't think she would have done anything about it. She wouldn't have called a, a, a developer and said, hey, I've got, you know, hundreds of lines of code that's coming up as an error because she wouldn't have known. So it doesn't matter if you empower somebody because I'm very big on empowerment. If they don't know how to ask why and how to problem solve, it doesn't matter that they have a big fence. Yeah. I've never heard it put quite that way, but I, I agree with you hundred percent. I mean, honestly, as, as sad as it sounds, the first thing that I think of in the way that you describe that is my dog. Right. I, I have a, I have a golden doodle. Right. And there are certain things that he has to learn how to do, but he does it starting in a kennel. Right. You learn how to be house trained and all that kind of stuff in the kennel. And then it slowly gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And, you know, this morning I was able to walk my dog and walk through the neighborhood without him on leash because he knows that he doesn't leave my side. Right. He, there's a certain area he can go, but he knows to stay out of the road. 
He knows not to go, you know, chase kids or chase other dogs or any of that kind of stuff, but he had to learn within the boundaries and then the boundaries got expanded. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, and that's also a part of the standard work is you don't even know where your fences are if you don't know what the standards are and you don't know what success looks like. So, yeah. Well, I'll, I'll tell you what, I mean, Landon already mentioned it, but I think we, we do need to have you come back. You've got other businesses that we want to learn about as well and have you share some nuggets of wisdom along the way with those businesses as well. So I've personally appreciated the conversation. I've learned some things today and quite honestly, Landon never teaches me anything. So it's good for you to be here to, to learn something from somebody. But uh, we do want to have you come back and we appreciate the conversation. Landon, take it home. Let's... Uh, Let's finish this up with a bang. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, well said with the exception of the uh, comments about uh, me, because we, we all know that's not, that's not true. I'm wise far beyond my years. Uh, no, Vicki, this has been, uh, this has really been incredible. And uh, we're really thankful that uh, you came on. And yes, we will definitely have you on again sometime in the very near future. But um, yeah, just as we, as we press up against time here, Vicki, two things. One, um, is there anything that you would like to close with? Uh, any thoughts or anything you'd like to share with us? And two, um, for people that want to either learn more about uh, Touchpoint or Vicky or any of the other uh, businesses that you're, you're part of, what's the best way for them to uh, you know, track you down? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you can connect with me on LinkedIn. It's a great place. You can find out more about Touchpoint at ilovetouchpoint.com. And if you want to reach out to me, you can go to vickimayo.com and there's a contact us form. You can always grab my email from there or reach out that way. I'd love to hear from people. If you have any questions on anything, I'm very happy to help and share. Um, one thing I will leave you with because it's my thought provoking uh, thought that I keep with me all the time. Um, it is that the difference between ordinary and extraordinary is just a little extra. So, you know, as you go through your day and your week this week, what can you do to just put a little extra in there? Yeah, fantastic. Love it. Well said. And I guess I have one last question. Okay. Can I come and pick up touch points today or do I have to order them on, on the website and have them shipped to me? <laughs> you actually have to, to order them online. I'm sorry, our, our warehouse is actually not in state or I would be happy to just get you a set. Um, but I'm really excited to hear about uh, your daughter and usage and included with every purchase is um, consultations from our team. So after you get them, please book your consultation appointment and they'll actually walk you through the best protocol specifically for her. Great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Great. Thanks for joining us, Vicki. Thanks. You've been listening to Tycoons of Small Biz proudly hosted by Austin Peterson and Landon Mance. Austin and Landon are comprehensive financial planning professionals specializing in financial, estate, and succession planning for small business owners. Austin and Landon have offices in Scottsdale, Arizona, and Las Vegas, Nevada, and represent clients in 14 states throughout the country. Join Austin, Landon, and the Featured Tycoons live every Tuesday at 1 p.m. right here on Business Radio X and your favorite podcast platform.